Hammersmith and Fulham and with TfL, and if she would deal with her colleagues in Hammersmith and Fulham and in TfL, perhaps we could actually get somewhere here. Or the question is to the leader, perhaps she agrees with some of her colleagues that the bridge should be permanently closed and that the suffering that people in Putney and Wandsworth overall are suffering now should be continued. I thank uh, Councillor for, for, for his question. I mean, I, the two, two things that uh, I might remind him and others uh, that um, Councillor Anderson will know, will know a former member of this council who is now the key advisor to the leader of Hammersmith and Fulham. And so perhaps she could just pick up the phone to her friend and say, do something, dear. I would have thought, uh, well, I would have thought. That's I, enough. I, I, That's I, also, I also say to Councillor Lua that back in July last year, I did a small a clip where, which was shown on the council's website about the, the, the effect of the Hammersmith Bridge closure on the people of Putney. I was quite surprised that within, within a day or two I had a letter from a cabinet member from Hammersmith criticizing every assertion I made. I was rather pleased that he was watching Wandsworth's uh, media stories of such regularity. Mm -hmm. He didn't accept any blame for it. He just simply nitpicked that I should have said this or that. I have to say, this Hammersmith's handling of this bridge is a complete disaster, yeah. not only for people of this borough, <coughs> but the whole of Southwest London. Yeah. Yeah. Time for question to lead, it is now over. Madam, <coughs> Madam Mayor, Madam Councillor Mayor, White. I would uh, like to move an adjournment uh, of the council for 30 seconds to draw attention to fire safety in this borough. Seconded. Councillor Henderson. Okay. okay, thank you. Sometimes a tragedy happens that resonates far beyond the affected community and reverberates down the years. Abathan and Hillsborough come to mind. They are moments that punctuate time and burn deep into the memory. Greenwich Tower is this generation's moment. With Grenfell, expediency, cost and profit meant more than, meant more than the safety of the poor people that died. A community was ignored, not respected, and priorities were inverted. This council needed to respond to ensure its residents' safety, and especially now that the, Greenwich, uh, sorry, the Grenfell Disaster Inquiry Part 1 is reported. The cladding on Grenfell was responsible for the rapid spread of fire, and it is now reported that companies who this council used to clad in Wandsworth probably knew that their cladding was unsafe. There needs to be prosecutions if Grenfell Part 2 shows this is correct. To their credit, this council did immediately set about decladding two buildings, not without drama. The government decided that this was essential work and financially assisted councils for that work. Some private blocks in Wandsworth are still clad in these dangerous materials and this government needs to act urgently to get it removed. The government deemed the sprinklers to be additional work, not essential work for local authorities responding to the tragedy. Despite this, after deciding to prejudge any consultation with residents, 24 million pounds of residents' money from the HRA was set aside. Leaseholders were told to pay at least 4,000 pounds each to sprink so sprinklers could be imposed on homes in blocks above 10 storeys. The residents know about their homes and they are also in receipt of the block's fire safety reports and the strengths and weaknesses thereof, but they were not deemed informed enough to influence a decision. They told the council that the blocks are very different from each other and needed to be treated on a block by block basis. They also talked about previous major works by this council that had left them wary of any alterations as their homes were built to contain fires within them, preventing spread to another flat, integrity through compartmentalization. Why take that risk where major works could already have undermined compartmentalization? Greenwich Inquiry Part 1 report pointed out combustible encasements on new windows, fan extractors that collapse in the event of, of a fire, non-fire standard, non-fire safety standard doors, flammable insulation and building materials could all undermine compartmentalisation. 
Surely each block should have been surveyed to find and correct any vulnerabilities. As Dan Daly, London Fire Brigade's Assistant Commissioner for Fire Safety said after the Lackanal house fire, if buildings are built and maintained correctly, walls, floors and doors in flats give you protection from fire. As freeholder, the council has responsibility for the maintenance to the structure of the building, the communal areas and resident safety. If individual flats are compartmentalised, a fire would be contained in an individual flat. So a water sprinkler system would protect that flat only. The structure and communal areas of a building would not be affected. Maintaining compartmentalisation should be this council's focus. Some blocks had suffered long history of design faults or major work concerns. Some were being declared and some residents may have felt vulnerable and they may have well wanted sprinklers, but this was never tested. And, that and if that need exists, it remains unfulfilled. HRA resources, residents' money, time and worry were all spent so this council could test at a first tier tribunal whether they had the right to implement sprinklers and charge all leaseholders living over 10 storeys before the Grenfell Inquiry Part 2 reported when recommendations about sprinklers would be made. The council endured a painful defeat at the tribunal as they did in court with the traveller injunction policy. At least now they will listen to legal judgments. 24 million still sits ring-fenced in the HRA and the council didn't think at any time during the last two and a half years that those resources might be better spent engaging with its residents and acting with respect and in the spirit of partnership to ensure their safety and reflecting their needs. Let's hope that happens now. Right, Councillor Caddy, Cabinet Member of Housing to respond. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I mean, I think I'd like to agree with Councillor White on his principle that um, obviously the Grenfell Tower tragedy was a huge wake-up call, I think, for everybody. Um, the government have recognised that and they'll be bringing forward fire safety legislation. And this council very rapidly recognised that and took immediate action. Uh, in terms of putting waking watches in the towers where they were aware that there was um, dangerous cladding, immediately um, moved forward with a program of removing that cladding. And I think there's a question about it later this evening. I think those two projects have, have gone very well. And I think they're undertaken with a, a huge amount of respect and, and collaboration with the residents. Um, and I think we very carefully considered what our approach needed to be to fire safety. Um, and actually, the approach has always been to put residents first and to make sure that we are protecting our tenants. We've always followed uh, fire safety experts in terms of their advice. And we've made the decision now to obviously wait until the outcome of the Grenfell inquiry um, and also further guidance from the government in terms of moving forward uh, to protect our residents by putting sprinklers in tall tower blocks. I think it's something which is an undeniable truth that sprinklers in tower blocks will save lives. They will um, put out the fires at source and they're the only um, piece of technology that we have at the moment that will do that. And I think I'm absolutely proud of this council for uh, wanting to and, and attempting to uh, agree with our residents and, and, agree with the in, and agree with the tribunal that we would go ahead and put those sprinklers in our box, blocks to protect our residents. Uh, the tribunal said that we couldn't bring a, a, a sort of group uh, application. It said we needed to apply on a block-by-block -block basis, but they made absolutely no judgment about the, the safety or the benefits of sprinklers. They made absolutely no judgment on that. Um, it's something that we now practically cannot do, and so as I said, we'll be waiting for the results of Gren Grenfell 2 and for further government advice, and we'll be m moving ahead in due course. And certainly, from my perspective, and I think from the Council's perspective, uh, one of the things we would want to do is engage with the residents and make sure that the, we bring them along with us. That's absolutely crucial. But what I would emphasise is that at the heart of the matter, this council and the officers and, and councillors have always had the fire safety, the safety of our tenants, absolutely first and foremost in our minds. 
So I, I, I would certainly not agree with Councillor White in terms of a lot of the things that he'd sa he's said, but I'd be perfectly happy to take a 30-second adjournment to um, reflect on the hard work that this council and the officers have done in terms of uh, improving fire safety in the borough and actually recognise the efforts that have gone on across the borough in terms of uh, improving fire safety. The motion now before Council is that Council do now adjourn for 30 seconds to draw attention to the importance of fire safety in Council blocks. There's no need to, to take it to an adjournment. Thank you. So now we go on to Cabinet members. Question number 12, Councillor Gibbons. Question number 12 of the Cabinet member. Thank you, um, Councillor Gibbons. Um, I know you to be um, an optimistic councillor. Uh, and, and no doubt a patriot as well. And so, so I, I take the first part of your question to be um, an unreserved, um, ambitious expectation as to the um, investment yield we can expect in, in Brexit Britain. But as, um, as the leader has already um, outlined in his earlier question, I think it's, it's much too early to come to any kind of conclusive impact on what um, the um, consequences on investment of, of, of Brexit are specifically, but clearly, and as we've said many times um, in this chamber at this time of year, the priorities for this council around uh, treasury management are very much, as the answer says, set in legislation, and it is security, liquidity, and yield in that order. Uh, and Brexit, however, you know, how, however one looks at it, is it is an external risk factor, and it has been considered in that context. Um, it's not considered, um, it's not considered um, an unmanaged long-term risk. Uh, and you'll see in the answer as well that that applies, you know, particularly to the pension fund here, where our investments are not, you know, will, will come as no surprise to you, they are not simply um, focused and centred on the UK. I, in, indeed, UK equities are a relatively small percentage of the fund. Um, so we don't see this as an unmanaged long-term risk. Um, what we do see is a very positive development is um, the election of um, a secure long-term conservative government which gives business the security they, they need to, to make investments over the last five years? Supplementary. Thank you. Um, I, I am, of course, a, uh, a great lover of my country, um, uh, but um, <laughs> given that uh, we don't know what the full impact of Brexit will be, at least until the transitional period is over, can Councillor O'Brien absolutely assure us that we will keep this at the forefront of our planning and scrutiny uh, for the, for the uh, next year as um, the, uh, the full, uh, I'm not quite sure what word to use here, the, the, the fullness of Brexit emerges. <laughs> Um, yeah, y um, <coughs> thank, thank you to the councillor for the question. I mean, the simple answer is um, yes. Uh, it, is an, it is an important year uh, in respect of Brexit and, and the deal that it struck with uh, the European Union. Um, so both in respect of our pension funds and our own treasury management, we will be tracking that as will every other authority and every other business. But ag to repeat again, um, both in, on the, the pension fund, where UK equities takes a small uh, per a percentage of, our, um, uh, of, of the fund's allocation, and in terms of uh, treasury management, where our focus is already, our priority is already to security. We don't see this as an unmanaged risk, uh, and we, it is one that is already well within our consideration. So um, the, the question is taken, but um, we don't see this as an unmanaged risk. Um, I'd, I think my question to the cabinet member would be that surely lots of longer term investments have actually been able due to the um, sadly perhaps slightly delayed process to leaving the European Union have actually been able to mitigate and to prepare for a lot of the challenges that leaving the EU may well throw up. Would you agree with me that actually a lot of these financial institutions in the city now are much more prepared than they would have been? certainly three years ago, and that in reality, our long-term investments are in a strong position to weather any potential challenges that we were to face. Um, I th thank the councillor for the question. I mean, it, it, is, um, 
it is an interesting feature, I suppose, as, as our first council meeting since, since Brexit, that it is still dominating the questions. And, and it is um, a particular enjoyment um, that um, as, a, as an elected councillor of the local authority that we, that we or as elected councillors of the local authority, we continue to have this chance to um, analyse macroeconomic global affairs in a way that we, we don't often do uh, or don't often see our place to do uh, as a local council. Um, that said, um, I, I would certainly agree um, with uh, Councillor Lua um, that, the, um, that the results of the, the recent election as I've noted already, gives a degree of certainty which will allow um, many institutions, many corporates, many of them, many of them um, from Europe and further afield to make decisions now in respect of their investment into the country um, in a way that they were unable to do so before. And we look forward to seeing the results of that. Thank you. Councillor Byrne. Question 13 to the Cabinet member. Um, thank you to the councillor for the question, and it's, it's a good question that partly got discussed with the ASD, but not really in the detail that it um, deserved, uh, and so I'm grateful for you raising it at, um, at, at full council. Um, we spent, in delivering, um, preparing our action plan, uh, we um, were very, very, very um, very keen to ensure that we demonstrated the seriousness and commitment with which we treat um, our environmental strategy and our target to be carbon neutral by 2030 as the greenest in a London borough. Um, to that end, we, we, we recognize that we would only be taken seriously if we were able to show real financial uh, commitment behind it. And that's why we spent a long time working out what we could put behind, put behind the action plan and allocating what we regard as a, a very meaningful sum of um, five million um, pounds. Um, however, as we have often described in this council chamber and in the OSC, we are, um, we are dealing with something that as a council, we believe uh, we've been taking action in, um, on for a number of years now. Um, and you know, wh whether that is uh, an early commitment, and I, you know, due credit to Councillor Cook, who I, who I know is one of the sort of forerunners in making that decision um, in, his, in, his, in his previous role um, to commit to um, EV charging points, or whether it's around air, air quality. And so I, I did ask um, officers to look at what spending we were uh, already committing in the last year towards this, uh, towards this goal and this, uh, this ambition and other spending that we would able to be put, to put forward uh, towards the action plan and um, its delivery. Um, and to that end, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to announce that, that, that Wandsworth is actually spending um, 20 million pounds um, in the delivery of its um, environmental and sustainability strategy, which is an enormous sum of money. Um, and um, I'm very delighted, that, I'm really delighted that we're able to do that. Sup supplemental, Madam Mayor. Councillor Byrne. That's a, a supplemental, a, amazing figure. And could perhaps Councillor Byrne tell us how maybe at ward level residents could take this forward? Is there, is it, how will the funding be devolved more locally? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Byrne. So much of the, um, much of the funding in, re in respect of that 20 million pounds is to large capital projects. And that's how it's allocated. But um, no doubt you will appreciate, we, we, we want to do as much as we can to deliver on what is a very ambitious target. Um, and so to that end, councillors will be aware that the, we have a Wandsworth local fund. Uh, and that local fund's next wave of funding will soon become available. And indeed, councillors will soon receive a uh, letter, if they've not done already, from the community partnerships team inviting applications towards that fund. And I would say this year we are particularly keen to see projects come forward um, that seek to uh, tackle climate change. Uh, and, and for Councillor Byrne, I, I would note that Battersea has almost 400,000 uh, pounds of funding available, which is a significant amount, and, and we'd very much encourage him to, to, to look for projects in his ward. So uh, in addition to the, to the 20 million pounds capital spend, there is other funding that we will make available to make sure we deliver on our 2030 target to be carbon neutral and London's greenest in a London borough. 
Second supplementary. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of other capital spending, I'm surprised the cabinet member hasn't mentioned the carbon offset fund. Can the cabinet member confirm that this council will be increasing the price per tonne of carbon to £95 in line with the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan's new draft London plan, or will the council leave it at its current level and continue to be a soft touch to development? Um, the simple answer to that is um, the carbon offset fund is something that we have focused on within our action plan, as you will know. Uh, and it is something that, in terms of the price that we will charge, that we are looking at it seriously. Again, as set out in the action plan, uh, we are not a soft touch. We recognize the, the role that um, uh, the uh, housing and development industry will play, both in, in terms of delivering uh, homes that are energy efficient, but also in the contribution, the wider contribution they make. For example, not, not only the carbon offset fund, but through SIL, and it is really through the delivery of SIL from developers that we're able to put significant sums of money into this action plan. Uh, and we will, we will continue to focus on the, that, you know, that opportunity to make sure we deliver on uh, our, our promises. Councillor Gibbons. Question number 14 of the Cabinet member. Um, thank you very much uh, to, to um, the councillor for his, uh, his, his question and indeed the, de the um, debate in respect of social value at the OSC. Um, we are very keen to see our small and medium-sized ent enterprises uh, prosper uh, and, and to thrive. And we very much encourage them uh, to look at opportunities to uh, contract either with the council directly or through our su supply chain. Um, this is something we've looked at for, for many years and we constantly keep under review as to what's the best way to support, um, to support not only small and medium sized enterprise but, but, but any enterprise um, w within the borough that, 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 that wishes to um, take part in a procurement exercise. We have found to date that the most effective way um, of supporting is through uh, Meet the Bio Days where actually our teams can meet with the businesses and explain what we are looking to achieve what the process is and how that might fit to what they do and, and how they might get there. And we will continue to do that. Um, at, this, at the same time, we seek to provide guidance on our website as, as set out in the question. Uh, and we will continue to update that as our procurement processes are also updated, including through uh, social value. Um, I would take the chance to say that, that um, the, the, I mean, the question is very much um, the question is very much um, appreciated because it is an opportunity for us to um, take a moment to reflect on this very important development in, in how we procure. The Social Value Act brought in by the last Conservative government really looks to put social value at the heart of procurement processes and we're very pleased and proud to be able to bring it um, down to the local level in a way that it has, has already been applied for now a number of years at central government. So we're grateful for the question and the chance to take a moment to reflect on this particular initiative. Councillor Gibbons. Supplementary. Um, well, thank you very much for, for your answer, um, which is very, uh, very full. Um, given that uh, one of the local indicators we're looking at would be uh, awarding uh, points, I suppose, in the bidding for uh, the London living wage, it's very positive that we're seeing a step in the right direction, but could I try and persuade you that actually the next step is worth taking where we ask all the contractors uh, to simply commit to paying the London living wage. So th thank you very much for the question. Uh, th this social value, the social value for procurement, again, has been given huge consideration um, by us uh, to look at what the London living wage is also looking to achieve, which is helping those, um, you know, our residents get on in life and those who are perhaps on a lower wage to, to have a higher wage. And um, we have we have debated many times the merits of, of the London living wage itself. And you'll no doubt have said the announcements from the Conservative government about what it wants to do to the living wage. And that, that definitely deserves mention. But for us here locally, um, of course, as an employer ourselves, we pay the London living wage. And the vast majority of our contracts to date, the London living wage is paid. So, so again, in terms of the context of it, um, 
we, it is something we have always encouraged, it's something we pay, and something that we see is important and has value. Um, however, the question is for us, how do we, as a local authority, um, which principally has responsibilities and obligations to our residents, and, and serious uh, responsibilities, and we, we will, through the questions, we've already talked about fire safety, we'll talk about our vulnerable young people, we'll talk about adult social care, how do we make sure that we are always delivering on those services and paying for them in a way that we can afford um, and at the same time um, supporting the, you know, our, our residents in other ways? Simply agreeing to um, prescribe the London living wage is something that would open us up to a cost that we are unable to quantify. That is a challenge for us that is not presented to many corporates in the example that we've given before. And so we recognize that as a problem. It, it is not a magic wand moment. We have to think, well, how else do we deal with it? And so our way of looking at this was to look at it through social value, to come up and to, to support a mechanism that gives flexibility around um, productivity and around social mobility. So that actually, through some of the, 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 the value that um, these corporates uh, and, and contractors will add, we will see the outcomes that we all want, um, whether that be more apprenticeships. It may even indeed be environmental um, um, social value that, that's added, or through more training, or for, through other methods and mechanisms to allow our residents to get on in life. Uh, and and I, I, I really think over the coming years we'll see the benefit of that come through and we will continue to look to see that it does because uh, you know, we, we remain a council that is absolutely committed to aspiration. We remain a council that is absolutely committed to social mobility. You know that we've made a social mobility pledge that is not forgotten by us. It is absolutely the heart of our thinking. Uh, and we think this, this, this new change in our procurement will deliver that and we're, we're really very proud of it. Uh, Councillor Field. Question 15 to the Cabinet Member. Thank you. I thank the uh, Councillor for the question. It's particularly nice to be able to answer this on a night when we're discussing climate change. As the answer says, the Tooting Common Heritage Project is a great example of a highly effective partnership between the local community and the Council. Yes, we did benefit from a generous grant from the Lottery Fund, but without the many volunteers and the 20,000 plus voluntary hours that went into this, it would never have been delivered. The project has now come to fruition and it's a fantastic success story. It has seen numerous improvements to the natural and built features throughout the common. At the bottom of the answer, you've got a link to the film and I would suggest you all look at it because we should be proud of what we've done here. I'd also like to give a bit of a shout out to some of the people who have played a part in this, and they would be the trustees of the Woodfield Project, the South London Swimming Club, the Tooting History Group, the Biodiversity Recorders, who found some new species of butterflies and many other things, and so many more. And I mustn't forget Gerard Sebastian, who is a Southfields resident who produced the beautifully illustrated information boards. And again, please do take a look at them if you're down there. From a visitor survey carried out in 2019, we know that our visitor numbers are rising. They've gone from 2.6 to nearly 3 million, and I think that is testament to the success of this project. Supplementary, Madam Mayor. My role is heritage champion and a trustee of the Woodland Project. Would the cabinet member join me in encouraging council members, all of us, and others in our community to visit these excellent facilities